Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview senior executives by posing the exact questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. This season of Compounders, The Anatomy of a Multibagger is sponsored by Tegas. Tegas is an innovative and disruptive company that is changing the way professional investors work. For more information, please visit their site at tegas.co. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. Our guest on the show today is Eric Ellen Logan, the CEO and Vice Chairman of Wildbrain. Wildbrain is a 500 million Canadian dollar market cap entertainment company listed on the TSX in Canada. The company operates through two segments, content business and Canadian television broadcasting. And through those segments, develops, produces, and distributes films and television programs worldwide. Wildbrain's intellectual property includes well-known characters such as Snoopy, Strawberry Shortcake, and Inspector Gadget. Eric became CEO during the summer of 2019 after being the co-president of Classic Media at DreamWorks and having served as the CEO of Marvel before it was acquired by Disney. Given Eric's vast experience in the media content production industry, I was very much looking forward to talking to Eric about Wildbrain's preferred business model, especially as it relates to holding onto IP versus selling shows to third parties, the opportunities for growth in the company's Peanuts franchise, what he has learned by watching Disney expand the Marvel franchise that he can replicate at Wildbrain, the strategy behind taking a hit show or popular character and turning those into consumer products revenue, and his thoughts on the high valuation studios have been receiving in recent deals. For full disclosure, Co Street is not a Wildbrain shareholder. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Wildbrain CEO and Vice Chairman Eric Ellenbogen. As always, we will start this podcast at a pivotal moment in the company's history. We'll definitely talk about the Peanuts acquisition, but I would like to start when you became CEO. So let's go back to the summer of 2019. You'd been on the board since 2018. What attracted you to taking the CEO role? And what were your initial priorities when you first took the reins? Um, That's a big question. Um, So look, what really attracted me to the company, uh, which I knew well because I competed with them in a number of acquisitions, was an incredible vault of IP assets that were either underexploited or misexploited, frankly, um, that should be generating a lot more EBITDA um, than they are today. And it, and it isn't just peanuts that you referenced, uh, but brands like uh, Teletubbies and Strawberry Shortcake and Degrassi, uh, Inspector Gadget, and many, many more. It's, it's a, uh, a deep well, 14,000 titles in the library that have been aggregated uh, uh, through a series of um, acquisitions over many years, but frankly, never really turned to account. So that that's the fun of it. And it's the same thing, honestly, that I've been doing for decades um, in acquiring IP and putting in a lot on creative uh, and then bringing those things back to market. And so uh, it's, you know, I know we'll talk more about it, but that's, that has been the journey of the last, uh, of the last two and a half years. Um, and so I first came in as a board member uh, and then, um, uh, you know, gave them some advice. I was an advisor for a period of time prior to assuming the, uh, the CEO role. But uh, I know these assets incredibly well. Uh, as I say, having either bid for them, some of them that I've owned in the past. Um, and so it was a bit of reunion, of a reunion with my misspent childhood. 
And we often like to joke that board members in reality know very little about how companies actually operate unless they join the management team and unless they really spend the time. And so I understand that you understood that you knew the assets well, but you know, that, that may not translate into knowing how they were being put to work or, or, you know, what it was like on the ground. So how do you think being on the board did indeed prepare you to be the CEO? Well, it, it, again, it was all very familiar to me and, you know, the, uh, the management team that uh, I inherited, there's some great people there were incredibly fulsome with the board. Um, I, I don't know that the board knew what to do with that information, though, necessarily. So while there was, you know, a high degree of transparency, what didn't exist was uh, I, I was the only show business person on the board when I joined. Um, and so apart from the management of the company, so just the ability to be helpful and uh, I think is, is really, I, I knew a lot. And then, uh, as I mentioned, Ben, I came in as an advisor to the company. And so I then got deeply in with the management and they kind of threw open the doors, uh, were incredibly embracing, uh, you know, and, and sort of eager to have my uh, perspectives and connections and, um, you know, uh, energy around a lot of the things they were doing. So I got to know the company pretty well uh, internally uh, as an advisor over a period of time. So I wasn't just, I was, I was sort of like a, a, a supercharged board member in, in that respect. Um, and, you know, I have to say it was, it was also familiar from another perspective for me because, um, you know, probably a really long period of my career over a dozen years uh, was in a private company setting uh, backed by private equity investors and who were incredibly helpful as board members. And we even tapped outside directors who we knew were industry experienced and would be able to lend a, you know, wisdom and support to our initiatives. And so I, the roles were reversed and I had the opportunity to help the company before I actually took a, uh, a direct management role. And uh, I want to talk about the business model and, and, and kind of how you look at the at, at you know what to do with the wild brand assets. But I'm interested. In, so it's been a it's been a couple of year journey. Like I'm trying to get a sense of like how. So you saw the opportunity. You knew all these assets were there. All these characters that have been underexploited, under monetized. Like what is conceptually? What is the process of getting the ball rolling there? And and and, and I think getting to the point. And, and I was talking to one of your large shareholders about this is just the time it takes for that all to play out. So maybe just give us some context for like, you know, the, the time it takes to, for, to, to kind of re-energize a brand or a character. And then, you know, kind of what you started to do when you, when you took the reins. Yeah, it, it is a, I think it's a not well understood process. And, um, and again, what I admire greatly about the company was an amazing collection of assets. And you can sort of think about them as like long-term high quality annuities and putting them back on track. And if you get it right, you just have these series of payouts over many, many years to come. And so it was about turning these things to account. And the first thing honestly was bringing in uh, some terrific new managers to the company um, who were deeply experienced and former colleagues of mine from uh, my classic media days, uh, from DreamWorks, from Universal, um, and, uh, and, that, and, and doing a bit of a reorg. So I think that was the first thing, getting each of the divisions, and uh, we'll go through that in a little bit because it's a really interesting vertically integrated company with licensing and merchandising, distribution, digital exploitation, um, uh, you know, proprietary production. Uh, those pieces had never really been knit together. So again, some really good taste in acquiring assets, uh, but not in putting them together. I, I recall actually, uh, I brought the entire management team together at my house uh, very early on in my tenure at the company. Many of them had never met one another. Uh, so again, they were kind of running their own show and 
generally doing it pretty well, uh, but there was no integration. So first things first was really sorting through the priority assets of the company. And again, these franchises that are critical and that become annuities and deeply investing in the creative side of the company, because ultimately that's what it's about. It is a creative driven business. It is a talent centric business. Um, and so it was a matter of taking a lot of things back into the workshop that were probably well down the line as far as development and production and getting them exactly right. And it was sort of understanding the DNA of each of these properties, which is really important. You sort of take it apart. You look at the operating history, uh, like again, some super successful properties out there like Teletubbies, like Inspector Gadget, like Strawberry Shortcake that had pretty impressive operating histories under their original ownership. And it was a matter then of like, how do we replicate that? There was nobody in charge of a brand. That was not something that the company did. Um, I, I think it's, it's worth reflecting on a little bit on the nature of the Canadian production business, uh, which we talk about a bit. And I don't want to get too far off track on this, but um, I've done a lot of production in Canada uh, just as you know, an American producer uh, for the longest time. And the technical quality of what they do because of certain tax advantages, they built an amazing animation industry, a technical animation industry. Yet, you know, I have to say that the content the original content that they produce has generally been pretty middle brow. And the reason is because of all of these incredible tax advantages that they have, often their margin would be no different than you know, the tax benefits. And therefore, there was, it was a manufacturing process. It built an incredible skill base, by the way. That is, that is the, that's the beauty of it. Technically, great stuff. But it, it, frankly, it was the American shows and the international shows that really had, you know, huge franchise successes uh, that they may have just been servicing, that they were not, in fact, owning. So the right move that happened well prior to my arrival was the aggregation of all of this content that was not Canadian content. These are big international libraries. I mean, this is peanuts. This is you know, Teletubbies, which was a UK property, uh, you know, Inspector Gadget, which was an American property, and all of these things coming together. So that's the base, and that's the IP, and I think what distinguishes us as, you know, the last big independent player in the kids and family business. So um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but it was really just going back, taking these things apart, not rushing anything to market. And in terms of the life cycle, it takes some years. So we are just now hitting our stride. And what you're beginning to see is, you know, as we set up um, peanuts and have, you know, enormous content uh, and multiple year content, like rolling through the system, you then see, well, it takes two to three years as consumer products then begin to hit. And the way it was done in the past is you push out a production and you sell a bunch of consumer products. That does not lead to great longevity. It is, it is like literally these franchises have to be built and layered one upon the other. Uh, and you, you don't lead with consumer products. You chase with consumer products once there's traction in the marketplace. And that's, that's the success story of so many of these properties because, you know, um, I, I, it's like Peppa Pig, everybody talks about an overnight hit 11 years in the making. Um, and, uh, you know, it takes, it takes a while as these things, you know, and the, the, the great part is these are very familiar properties, but it does take some time. And, you know, you can be looking, just the production cycle can be, you know, 18 to 24 months, then a product begins to appear in the market, uh, then consumer products 
can sometimes take another 24 months following that uh, in order to kick in. So we're, we're actually in the early stages of that. And you're just seeing with Yo Gabba Gabba, with Degrassi, with other things that have been in the workshop and now, now are going into production uh, uh, along with the exploitation of their libraries. Compounders is brought to you in partnership with Tegas. We created Compounders to uncover the lessons and frameworks of the best capital compounders in the world. And if you are a professional investor, VC, or operator, and you appreciate the deep research into the businesses explored on this podcast, check out tegas.co slash compounders. With Tegas, you can learn about any company directly from former execs, current customers, and industry experts, all of which are in position to offer unique insights into company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. The platform offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies such as Compounders Guests, Viasat, Element Solutions, and Avid Technology. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access to nearly 25,000 expert call transcripts. And the best part, the Tegas collection grows larger with each investor and company that joins. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas is the right solution. Experts that are just as good or better than what you'd find on other networks, but starting at just $300 per call, not the $1,000 or more others charge. If you're ready to go deeper on the next compounding business, head to tegas.co slash compounders for a free trial. I can personally say that having access to the Tegas platform and Rolodex of experts has fundamentally changed the quality of due diligence Coast Street does on both new and existing ideas. That was a really interesting comment about Canada being more of a production engine versus like an intellectual property builder. So I want to dig in a little bit on that. So you know, we we discussed with, with Jennifer McCarran from Thunderbird when she was on the show about the huge amount of demand from the streaming players for, for content to fill up their platforms. And so, you know, there's, I think there's a temptation to kind of just be a service player for that and like, fill that need. So I'm just trying to get a sense of like, what is your view on the role wild brain should play in supplying content to third parties, like whatever Netflix or, or Hulu or something like that? What, what, what is, what is, how, how do you think about like holding on to IP and trying to monetize it yourself versus, you know, um, servicing that, that demand that that's out there? Okay, that's, that's a really good question. And I think something that is not well understood. Um, so if I may, um, look, uh, you know, Warner's is a vertically integrated company and, you know, makes movies and television shows and so on. They also rent out sound stages. Uh, that is a very different business. There may be pretty good margin on it, but there's no IP bill around being in the rental business. We're in the owning business. And um, probably, you know, three quarters, 80% of what goes through our giant production studio in Vancouver are either things that we own outright or in which we have a significant ownership stake, distribution rights, percentages of consumer products, uh, uh, digital management and ownership, uh, all of which are the aggregation of margin across the entire value chain. So indeed the demand is great among streamers um, and it has created a, it's driven costs up first of all, but, uh, and it's, it's created a incredible demand for talent and I always come back to talent, that's where it starts. And so when we look at uh, what you can call service work or renting out a soundstage, um, we take that on for sure in you know, very careful amounts where it's going to drive talent and build a base and is really attractive. So we, we just, we're just finishing a show for Disney. We don't own it. That was service work, but it was very attractive. And it was the kind of thing that talent wanted to work on. And so that's really, really important to attracting and retaining that talent in the studio is you gotta, you gotta give them stuff that they really like. If it's just a job, 
then your ability to hold that talent is pretty limited. So if it's just about collecting a paycheck and it's not a passion, um, and, and that's the part that, you know, honestly is so different about our business from a lot of other businesses where it's either, it's, a, you know, a job or a passion. And, and we are at the intersection of art and commerce. And therefore we will take on some of that demand and service work to the extent that it builds our creative base. But uh, to be sure, most of that demand that we meet is with stuff that we own, or again, have ownership stakes in, uh, that continue to build the equity in the company. And it's very, very different because one is operating as an IP company, and the other is as a service studio. And there are great service studios out there, by the way. They're terrific, not only in Canada, but, you know, and we work with a lot of them. We will often farm part of our work to Korean studios or overseas studios to do certain of the very, you know, workmanship-like aspects of animation. And given that perspective as an, you know, an IP company and an owner, as opposed to a renter or a seller of assets, I mean, you have an interesting kind of seat as, as you're watching what's going on in the industry. So if I use the words content bubble, to describe the spending that is tied to the land grab for streaming subs that, that is ongoing right now. Would that resonate with you at all? Does that, I mean, when you see, you know, $30 billion in spending and, and, you know, everyone seems to be the, and cost rising everywhere. I mean, it just feels to me like if from an outsider's perspective that there's just some possibly unsustainable um, demand uh, occurring, how would you, how would you answer that? No, I, I, listen, I don't disagree with that. Um, I think that the it, it is an arms race right now uh, among the services, um, and it frankly it's no different. And, and you know I've been around long enough to see every form of media. You know you look at the the home video business, and you know uh, what happened there just in terms of uh, needing to acquire content. Uh, and, you know, what they would pay for direct-to-video originals. I, I actually participated in that business. Or you look at uh, cable and, you know, how dollars began to shift from uh, traditional over-the-air uh, TV to, uh, to cable channels. And they had to build themselves up because they wanted to get subs uh, where they got, obviously, great comp and then were compensated as well on the basis of, of ad sales and, and bringing audience, um, you know, uh, independent studios and the movie business and the competition for talent and, uh, you know, and great movie properties. So I, I think we're seeing the same thing, but what you have to uh, recall uh, is that it's, it's about a marketing buildup too. And that's why almost all of these services, which, you know, we're a great beneficiary of this. Love brands because brands equal uh, pre-sold marketing because it's really, really hard to get an audience's attention. And I think all of us who have smart TVs, you turn that TV on and first you see, you know, 20 channel titles that go up and then you start exploring Amazon Prime Video and Apple TV Plus and HBO Max and Paramount Plus and Disney Plus, a lot of pluses. And, and, then you st and then finding shows, they're hard to find. And I think that most people, you know, those channels really are not brands. I think Disney is a brand for sure, but they are unique in the industry. Th they're really not brands. And people watch shows, they don't watch channels. And I don't know whether, Ben, you found yourself going like you heard about a show and you go like, is that, is that like Netflix? So is that HBO Max? Or it? But finally you get there. Um, and, but it's because it's something you've heard of. Uh, and it was either a review that you read or word of mouth or, or often something that was like, that was your favorite book. And it's now been turned into a movie uh, or a particular actor or a director. And that's kind of what, and those are brands themselves, if you think about it. 
And, you know, that's why star power is often important or it's a new Ryan Murphy show and you really like, you know, the Ryan Murphy brand. So I think there's an awful lot to that. Um, but, you know, as to whether it's sustainable or not, this is going to go on for quite some time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very, very high stakes. Um, but make no mistake, you know, the number of viewing hours are going up. And what you're seeing, again, is a shift from linear television to nonlinear television. The reaggregation of channels around these virtual MPVDs um, and, you know, viewing styles have changed. Uh, but I think the, the demand for content is great. I, I'll add in another, uh, you know, something you didn't ask about, but I think is a really interesting factoid around these streaming services. And that is, um, and it, it's not a big secret, but it's not generally spoken about that much. And that is that kids and family content are probably the most significant driver of subscriber acquisition and retention. You are not going to pull the plug on your kids. It just is not going to happen. And so um, we learned that when I was at DreamWorks and uh, struck a deal with Netflix to make a thousand series half hours. And it was all data driven. It was, it was the, and, and we'll come to what we're doing on the data side uh, and our unique abilities in, in farming data on our AVOD channels. But um, they knew what was going on. And it was first the DreamWorks library that Netflix acquired and the, the viewer acquisition that that drove and then following that, moving into the TV business, like how important that was in attracting new subs and in retaining them. And in, in, you said a, a number of really interesting things already. Um, and, and I want to get into you know, the capabilities of this company to monetize the IP. So in, in your presentations, you talk about having a 360 degree capability when it comes to monetizing IP, what does that actually mean? And, and how does it differentiate what wild brain in your mind? So um, yeah, well, let's think about it as the, you know, the product life cycle and the touch points that consumers have with uh, the shows that they love, the characters um, and, um, and the brands and that they have a relationship with these brands. So when we say 360, it's really our ability uh, uniquely, and it, 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 and it takes a certain critical mass in order to pull this off. Few independent companies can actually do this because you have to have a very big base of business and a treasure trove of intellectual property uh, and, you know, frankly, the revenue and the EBITDA in order to make it happen. <clears throat> and that is from... Uh, content acquisition to the creative process and having the best creators through development, uh, consumer testing, the production studio, uh, delivering the finished product, uh, marketing, uh, our AVOD distribution channel as a way of amplification of the intellectual property that we have a vertically integrated consumer products operation that then can exploit in CP uh, the IP asset that's been built, uh, distribution that is not only to through our own channels, but also across other AVOD channels, SVOD channels, um, every form of media, uh, audio, um, uh, it is, it is literally the, the entire bundle of the IP exploited across. And I use that in the best, <laughs> it's an industry term. It, it really is. So I don't mean that in an exploitative way, but in a way that aggregates margin across the entire value chain. That is, that is what 360 is. And it is, it's brand management. It's everything. That's frankly what like really well-run studio distributors do that are entirely vertical organizations. And um, 
So as opposed to an independent producer who just has a piece of IP and they make a show and then it's sort of handed over. In this new media world, it is no longer just about delivering a show to a network and then like hoping for the best. You, you really have to like watch that very carefully and you have to market it and you have to support it and do all of the things again that a traditional studio distributor does in order to support the IP. And again, the old days, you'd make a show. I did a lot of these. You deliver it to Cartoon Network. They take care of the marketing. Uh, they take care of the programming. In an on-demand world, you and every viewer is a programmer. And so how are we going to reach you? What are the touch points? How do we market to you? How do you get engaged with the IP? That's what 360 is. It's, it's like, you know, it's our Shanghai office working, you know, across uh, mainland China in, you know, the distribution of our peanuts content and then engaging consumer products and doing events and location-based entertainment. It is literally, it's 360. It's every spoke uh, of the hub of IP. Uh, and that's, that's what we do. And you mentioned the uh, the gold standard brand in this industry, which is Disney, and and it is you know it, it is absolutely true that people go see you know Star Wars films and Marvel films and Disney films and absolutely you know, regardless of who the producer is. I mean, it's just it's it's amazing the brand they've created. And so you were actually the CEO of Marvel before it was acquired by Disney. I'm interested in what you could take away from the success that Disney has had expanding the Marvel universe. Um, as you build Wild Brain, because you talked about this library of characters that had been under monetized. Talk about Marvel is a lot of that too, right? Then, and we see new characters coming out all the time. How how what how has have what Disney done? Like, how can that help you and you know, guide you and in, 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 as you're building this company? Well, look, uh, there there's um, I, I can take inspiration uh, and maybe steal a few ideas as well. Um, there is nothing like. What Disney does. I mean, they, they are, are unique in uh, the media world. Uh, the aggregation of assets is unbelievable. Uh, talk about 360. I think they've got, uh, you know, more points of degrees than 360. Uh, and they're, and I, I just saw they're, they're opening a, a Disney community in the California desert uh, that was announced the other day. I mean, it is like their ecosystem is exquisite. I mean, it, it really is. Um, and, and, and more than that, they are inspirational brand managers. They, they really, they take their time, you know, they take very, very good care of their intellectual property assets. Uh, and with Marvel in particular, uh, where I was for a, a brief time out of, as they came out of bankruptcy, I mean, it, it is like, it is a very deep well of IP, uh, incredible. Uh, and what they also did, uh, and again, we do this in our own way, is brought the greatest creative talent on the planet uh, to those properties. And it snowballs, it builds on itself. And so with each success, that's where a director wants to be. That's where, you know, an editor and the best special effects designers and so forth. You want to work on the really good stuff. Lucas, the same way. I mean, the, 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 the genius of LucasArts uh, before it was acquired by Disney is it was the mecca for anybody in special effects and in digital industries, their own, by the way, proprietary licensing and merchandising organization. Uh, LucasArts was, was the name of that group uh, at Lucasfilm. Um, and uh, they were in a way uh, a vertical company too although they did film distribution through, uh, through Fox, I believe, at, uh, in, in the early years. But what, just going back to, to Disney and what Marvel has come to represent uh, is really, in a very smart way, you know, the intersection of worlds of uh, you know, something for all ages and all audiences. And, and in a way, they changed what a family film was. So a family film used to be Flipper, uh, no longer. It's about superhero movies. And there was this, and, and creating franchises. 
they really, they sort of single-handedly did that. Uh, and, you know, the, the business of family films is now uh, the dominion of the streamers. It's a really good business, but basically um, Marvel extinguished what was the theatrical family film business. It completely supplanted by superhero films. And, um, you know, one thing that Disney's done really well with, with Marvel specifically is create new franchises from characters in the universe that may have been forgotten. Maybe they weren't household names. And, and I know you're working on bringing Strawberry Shortcake, and which is a, a brand from my childhood, um, back into the mainstream. So, I, I'm you know, and you discuss IP turnarounds in some of your presentations. So I'm interested if we could uh, use Strawberry Shortcake as a case study that highlights that process of building a brand back to life. And you can talk about the timeline because I think that's a really important thing for people to understand. Like you don't just wake up and say, hey, Inspector Gadget is now a huge brand. It's like, there's a process. So let's use Strawberry Shortcake as a, as a, as a case study so that people can understand how it works. Really, really good question, Ben. So that, that, that is an example. And I appreciate your conflating Strawberry Shortcake with the Marvel Universe. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and what they do, and and incidentally, they they themselves have become just to like spend one more minute on Marvel. I'm very fond of them. Um, uh, the the brand itself has created a certain expectation in the same way that the Star Wars brand has. So I think they have the ability because of the incredible pipeline of hugely successful franchises to get you into the tent for the next one, even if it's something you've never heard of, right? So, uh, you know, yes, the IP library is deep, but they have developed a flywheel that is just remarkable. And it's that that brand represents something. It's a certain kind of entertainment. And so you go to the theater or you go to Disney Plus with an expectation. And so once again, the brand brings you into the tent and then they actually put on a really good show. And that just reinforces your desire for more. And by the way, some much more engaging and franchise like, you know, others may be, you know, like a double instead of a home run, but nonetheless, you'll come back for more because the, the, the standard of quality is just so incredible. And, you know, the, the great storytelling uh, that uh, those characters represent. But, uh, but uh, thank you for the comparison uh, now to Strawberry Shortcake. So uh, look, this, this property has been quite successfully reinvented, not a few times. And it has incredible, an incredible performance history. And it was, believe it or not, a $4 billion brand at retail. So for what I do, this is the perfect kind of property because there's a DNA to it. There is, it, it, it definitely engages three to seven-year-old girls in a really interesting way. There is a USP to it, which is like the strawberry shortcake scent and like, you know, the enterprising young girls, uh, it's very contemporary in that sense. Um, and in, you know, the world of ecology and growing things and baking and like these very, very deeply grooved developmental aspects to the property. And I always, uh, having acquired many, many properties and rebuilt them over the years, you do have to ask yourself, so like, there, are, like the pro there were properties that came out at the same time as Strawberry Shortcake and that entered the market with great flourish. But I promise you, they're like a Trivial Pursuit card now. Like, why didn't they endure? What was it that was sort of lacking? Hey, they were on the Saturday morning schedule. They, you know, were back by ABC Television. Uh, whatever it was at the time that they were launched, and I often reflect on that, which is like, what you know, the cream rose to the top. What was it specifically about that IP 
that gave it such evergreen and enduring value. So that's, that's the creative that you got to crack when you bring one of these properties back. So it's not just a refresh. It's not just a rinse and repeat. Uh, it is really just going into the, you know, the core of the property and understanding what the unique appeal is and then bringing that back to market. So we took our time to relaunch. I, I can tell you when I first joined the company, they were ready to roll out new strawberry shortcake. That was two and a half years ago. And I pulled it right back into the studio and we took it, which they had never done before into focus group testing and you know we spent two days like sharing concepts with moms and kids and there were very fond associations but a lot of them kind of didn't get the show that we were planning on making and so it was like back to the drawing board and i think that that that's the sort of patience you you, you can't extrude these things uh, and it is about getting the creative right. So we did that. Uh, it's about building, you know, audience engagement first. And with this particular property, because, and I know we're going to come to this in our discussion, I hope, is, you know, the role that YouTube plays in bringing specifically kids' properties to the market. And we decided that since YouTube is incontrovertibly the primary platform for content discovery and initial engagement, it is the leading platform for kids. That would be the place to go. Now, I have to say, probably five years ago, we wouldn't have done that. Would not have done that because linear television, a little bit earlier, could easily sustain that. That was the place to go. And by the way, there was no binging. There was no, like that didn't exist. You didn't dump your entire investment, you know, on one weekend um, and just like hope for the best. Um, it was titrated out. You know, it was a little bit of content at a time. It had an opportunity to build. There was audience engagement. Um, and then you began to see these things take off. So we're taking a very similar approach um, as a digital first launch. And we are producing directly and managing that. This is part of the 360 then on our own Spark network, which is our AVOD network, um, which we manage something like 800 channels and you know 20 billion views. Um, that's where we start. And then we begin to extract data as well. Which stories are resonating? Which characters does the audience particularly like? What languages, which territories, because we dub it into multiple languages, where is it getting traction? What is the refinement that has to take place? That's a very new feedback loop that frankly, heretofore has not existed in the market. You made a show and you put it on the air and then it either took or it didn't. Um, and you'd either be renewed or you were canceled. And you were very much at the mercy of and in the hands of, you know, telecasters in order to make the hit for you. There's a great deal more control that we have now in the current environment and the way that we manage these things. And so that is, that's, that's the way we get going. So that, that's like a, you know, 18 to 24 month process of putting the shows up. We've now struck a, uh, a very important deal to make strawberry shortcake specials. And, you know, those are going to be going up on, on SVOD. Um, and it's part of what I call the always on. So you want to be anywhere and everywhere that kids live, right? So you want to be at county fairs. You want to be in the grocery store. Uh, you want to be consumer products. You want to be everywhere. You want to be ubiquitous and find all the different touch points of engagement for kids and moms, frankly, to have with your property. That's the build. That's the 360 of it all. And then we'll begin to roll. I mean, we have a, a great toy partner uh, in Moose Toys uh, for Strawberry Shortcake. 
Uh, and, you know, we're, we're very active in toy development at the moment. But, um, you know, no strawberry shortcake before it's time. You don't want to lead with CP. You want to chase. That's what you want to do. You want the market to reestablish itself. You want to find out, you know, uh, forgive the pun, where the sweet spot is with strawberry shortcake, which are the characters that kids want to engage with most. And you kind of never know. I, I, I'll give you, a, by the way, a, um, and, and we just, you know, I know this, uh, it should be obvious to a lot of people from, you know, DreamWorks. I, nobody knew that King Julian was going to be the star of Madagascar, right? I mean, it was an amazing character turn, Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, voice the character and it was like it was that that was the hit now that is if you want to think about it and you know I, I consider my colleagues at at DreamWorks or former colleagues to be genius I mean they're just amazing talents but I don't think they knew that and it wasn't until Sasha Baron Cohen got in the studio created the character uh and it's like whoa that that, that is that, what an amazing character. And guess what? That became the franchise. And, you know, when we started making, when I was at DreamWorks and we started making television for Netflix, it was the King Julian show. That was the show. Um, and in the same way, I think if you asked Chris Melodondre at Illumination, when he made Despicable Me, whether the Minions would be their own, the star of the show, I don't know that that was necessarily predictable. They were cute. They were in the show, but they weren't really at the core of it. They were ancillary characters. And yet they became the locomotive for subsequent Despicable Me's. So that's, that's part of that discovery, but, but that's a very expensive development process if you're making movies to figure out like you know where the hit is. We now have the capability of doing that through these digital channels um, and by then putting that content, not just on our own AVOD network, but distributing it everywhere so that kids can then reconnect or connect for the first time uh, with this IP. So it's a long game. The strategy is very, very deliberate. But what I want to come back to, and it was part of your original question, Ben, forgive the run on sentence, that it, it's like you layer each of these in. So this is like, this is one of the annuities. Right. So you switch that on. And I mean, just as we did, Peanuts was kind of the first out of the gate. And you sort of see now the content that's coming through with Snoopy in space and then the Snoopy show and then the specials. And then, you know, Apple putting, you know, billboards up on Sunset Boulevard for our shows. And it is just like and, and then the consumer products begin to roll. And we had like an amazing quarter where you know, CP was up like 35%. I mean, it was really staggering. But that, that you're just seeing the, the business begin to unfold. And that's, that is, that's really, and Strawberry Shortcake is a great example of that. That's one of our big hits. And it's like, let's put that on the track now. And it will then run through the development and production process, specials, short form, uh, you know, in-person engagement. Um, and then the consumer products begin to roll behind that. And you then, you know, develop all of these sort of simultaneous streams of revenue that start coming through the system. Uh, and that is what we're in the early days of. And you're beginning to see a lot of that come through um, as we announce one project after another. And when this company bought the Peanuts franchise from Iconics in 2017, you guys took on a little bit of debt um, and the debt levels have come down a fair amount, but I'm interested, you know, it sounds like you have a fair amount of growth baked into the future, given, you know, that the rollout period of, of these, of the IP and the consumer products, but I'm just trying to get a sense of, as you're thinking about allocating dollars and, you know, whether it's CapEx or OpEx or even acquisitions, like how big a priority is debt pay down in your own mind? I really just don't think about the debt anymore. I mean, um, and I mean, you're very kind. They didn't take on a little amount of debt. They took on a lot of debt. And, and I would have bet the farm as well on the acquisition of Peanuts. It is, it is the crown jewel of our IP collection. It is an amazing, uh, enduring, you know, getting to the 75th year uh, property. Uh, it is, it's like, it's the envy of, 
uh, of my industry. Um, so I, I don't think about it because we're so comfortable where our leverage is now. And, you know, it's only a problem if you can't pay it, right? So uh, uh, debt is good in the respect that, you know, that leverage allows us uh, to use equity to do other things, to uh, invest in that creative pipeline, to acquire new content, uh, to put money into our AVOD division, to uh, build out our CP operation. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of that, a lot of the, what you would think of as CapEx, it's, it's people. And that was, by the way, the big build over the last two and a half years was just getting this amazing team together that then gives us operating leverage. So we then can take on a lot more. I mean, our studio, for example, in Vancouver, uh, at the time I arrived was something like 800 people. 750, 800. I, I think it's it's like 1,000, 1,100 now, right? There's operating leverage there. And so that, that again is, you know, there is an issue of scale here that allows you to do all of these things. Um, and, but we're super comfortable where, where we are. We've given guidance that that, you know, it's coming down to the low fours. Um, and I'm very, very comfortable with where that is. We we refied the debt, uh, you know, on very favorable terms. Um, and I've got an amazing CFO in, in Aaron Ames. Um, and uh, literally, you know, we do not drive looking in the rear view mirror. I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, we're just very focused on the future of the company and it is not an issue. And, and incidentally, I think that, um, you know, the, the analysts who follow us, I've gotten kind of gotten that now. I don't. I don't think I've gotten a debt question honestly uh, in the last uh, uh, three quarters. It, it's like you know. I think it's somewhere in the background. But it's like one of those things you, you can only obsess over things you can measure, right? So I, I think that because it's measurable and it's like a you know, it's a piece of data. It's like should we worry about that? I, I, I'm not worried about it in the least. And you mentioned uh, the Apple relationship with peanuts and and how you've and 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 that how that's expanded. Maybe just briefly discuss you know what that relationship looks like in terms of shows and 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 content. But also, I'm interested in how you make that relationship so sticky that Apple keeps coming back for more content and, you know, that the brand, uh, you know, that you don't have the same issue where you did, you're on for two seasons and you get canceled. Like, how do you make that relationship really sticky with Apple? So um, that's an interesting question. Um, and, and I haven't never thought about it quite in that way of like, you know, how do you please your buyer? Um, uh, uh, it, it, and we don't actually even think about it that way. So, um, but here's maybe the way to, uh, to characterize that. So, um, first of all, peanuts and apple are exhibit A in the appeal of huge branded globally known IP. And the value of that to a gigantic streamer, a big, big brand. And in a way, and you talked about this before, and I agree completely, you look at the constellation of brands in the Disney universe, those are just like gigantic brands. I mean, that's Pixar and Star Wars and Marvel and so on. It's the same. So played out on a somewhat lower scale, but when Apple or any of the streamers look across the content universe. It's like, what are those big brands? How are we going to engage audiences? How is also that particular brand consistent with the audience that we have and the way that we want to appear to them? And so what we did with Apple is to conceive a comprehensive, multi-year output plan, very, very carefully plotting out over a period of years, the uh, unfurling of stories and characters and, you know, that frankly appeared in the Charles Schultz 
uh, scripts. But I mean, do we do we really know Pig Pen? Um, like, you know, what is Schroeder's story? What about Franklin? I mean, it is a very deep well of IP. And what's marvelous about Schultz and, you know, having grown up, you know, reading newspapers, which I'll tell you how old I am, um, it is like, these are really deep stories. I mean, there is, there is like, you know, they aren't the funnies in the uh, usual sense. There's like, you know, a lot of meaning to, and social commentary uh, to what Schultz did. And so um, there was a bit of a proving ground that was done in the Apple 1.0 deal. We'll call it that because we basically have done two big deals with Apple. And it was all about the greatest content. That's again, it was about incredible creative. And when you have that magnet of this kind of IP, everybody wanted to work on it. It is, it's like one of those things, that's what creators want to do. It's they, they, they love the characters and the opportunity to create the first new content in decades, because this is not Charlie Brown Christmas, you know, or, or the Halloween pumpkin story. This is like brand new, hasn't been any brand new um, in a very, very long time. So it was with great care and planning, bringing that back. And the first show was, was Snoopy in Space. And it just resonated incredibly with the Apple brand and with their audiences. It had just tremendous viewership. Um, and then that progressed to this big long-term deal. And they have been amazing partners, incredibly supportive. And I have to say, they give us movie star attention. The, the promotional dollars that Apple, the Apple TV team has put behind these shows is wildly impressive. And, you know, uh, I'm based in New York and, you know, I saw it on bus shelters. I mean, what, what like, you know, what show goes on a bus shelter, right? You know, maybe House of Cards or like, you know, something like that. But it, it, this is a big brand for Apple and Apple TV. And we are just delighted with that partnership. So that's, that's kind of where it started. And I think again, snowballs. And then we sort of, now we're seeing that again, at least in the wild brain system, run through sort of consumer products, uh, gaming, uh, location-based entertainment. And it is also, I should point out, uh, I think maybe a lot of your listeners don't know this, Amazingly, Peanuts content, the stuff I grew up on, those TV specials, they're virtually unknown outside of the United States and Canada. They've never seen it. And so the, the Apple platform, a billion iPhones out there, those are our little TV sets. And that is getting global exposure for the property. Many consumers outside the US, like Japan is a gigantic territory for Peanuts and Snoopy. They've never seen anything. They've never seen the shows. They just think Snoopy is cute. And it's very, it's, it's sort of in that Hello Kitty way, right? That it's not, it was not a filmed entertainment content driven property. It is a unicorn to be sure in my business. And, but now you have this amazing content coming through and it is instantaneously distributed across the globe. And so that is a thing that is like a, that is a Saturn rocket on the peanuts property. And we're very excited about it. And again, it's very self-reinforcing because more creators want to come to it. There are more interesting stories to tell. The audience is incredibly engaged. And we will be very careful, as will Apple, about rolling this out on a very programmed, you know, very strategic basis to keep the audience engaged and entertained. It's, it's pretty exciting. But that, that's, like, that's like the greatest example I can give you of like, you know, how do you properly manage one of these things uh, for incredible, enduring value? 
And that's what we're going for. It's not, it's not about overnight hits. And I have another industry level question for you. I'm sure you've noticed the recent deals in the studio space, including the big valuations at Hell of Sunshine and Moonbug, which is also a, a, entertainment, a children's entertainment studio, what they got acquired for. I'm just trying to get a sense of when you talk to the board about you know, these deals and what, what kind of valuations these other studios are getting for, like, how does, how does that influence what you think this co- your company's worth or what you should do um, given that, you know, that, that kind of that demand that's out there, especially from private equity? Yeah, it's, look, um, the, look, this is not new. The consolidation trend is, you know, inevitable. It is a force of gravity in our industry. Um, we are, I like to say, the last great unattached electron uh, in the kids and family business. And the critical mass of IP that we have is enviable. You couldn't do it today. This assembly could not happen. Um, When I look at those values, um, it's kind of flattering. Uh, Clearly the public markets aren't giving us that attribution, but I think as they begin to understand the true asset value and the steady state that is, you know, coming very soon. We're, you know, had five great quarters of growth. When you sort of look at that, um, you will get recognized. It will happen. I mean, we're, you know, a little Canadian company, you know, traded on the Toronto Exchange. Um, and our story is pretty well known inside the industry, I have to say. I mean, I, you know, I'm here in Los Angeles this week talking to you and, uh, you know, seeing a lot of, of my colleagues in the business, they know who we are. I mean, they know the quality of the work and, you know, we work with, with you know, the Disney's and uh, HBO Max and like, you know, all the players know who we are. But that's an inside industry story. That's not so much an investor story. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think that you know is uh, I, I literally put a muzzle on uh, you know any IR, any touting, no press releases, like for literally two years, because I think unfortunately there was a bad habit before of like you know leading with a lot of news and then not delivering the financial results, and because. You know, I spent, uh, you know, a dozen plus years uh, working back by private equity. We were not quarter to quarter managed. It, it was like, you know, what can we do to just increase the value of these assets? And we didn't issue any press releases. Uh, it was just all about like, you know, making the assets work, about steady state, about really, you know, building equity value and acquiring more stuff. and. I, that's kind of my training. So that's kind of where I went to uh, when I arrived at the company. And only recently now where I feel there are some solid accomplishments, uh, have I felt the confidence in going out and talking to people about it. And, and frankly, I would, you know, if you invited me to do this two years ago, I would have politely declined uh, because there was nothing to talk about. It was like we were just hard at work like rebuilding this thing and putting these assets on track. So what I have to say about it, there are great comps in the industry. Uh, I think they are, they're big comps, frankly. And uh, I have to say, uh, compared to the assets that we have, uh, we should be getting a stunning number and valuation. Uh, just because I, I know what's there. I know the other properties. I know the competitive set. Um, and what we have has, you know, an incredible track record and enduring value um, and, you know, is exactly the kind of annuity asset uh, that, uh, that sort of counts in our business. And by the way, look at, like, look at the big companies, you know, and you, you, I mean, forget about what's going on at Paramount Plus and a lot of noise there and so forth, but you, you look, it's Godfather. It's Top Gun. It's Star Trek. It's like, you know, 
that's that's the story of those of those studios and what they are and at Warner's it's you know it's Looney Tunes it's Batman it's you know Harry Potter and so but they're gigantic brand companies that's what they are and you guys have a lot of different things in the hopper, whether it's peanuts, whether it's um, renewing uh, strawberry shortcake, whether it's bringing back Teletubbies and, and, and Inspector Gadgets. So there's a lot going on. But, you know, as a firm, we like to focus on key variables. So what do you think are the three things this company absolutely has to get right for this stock to be a good investment for um, both investors and your employees? Mm. So um, I'll see if I can do it in three. Um, uh, first it's, I come back to creative and talent. We got to get that right. You got to get the show right. And it's, it's not about like just slapping a new label on an old soup can. Um, and that's also the magic and the fun of our business is the creative reinvention. Um, but when you start out with amazing assets and you take very good care of them, uh, you have that opportunity. So first, it's it's about the creative. Uh, second, it's about the the way we relaunch those properties, which we have to get right. And it's about that always on. So it's selecting the right platform. Um, and you know, I'll just take it back to Strawberry Shortcake uh, for one second. We didn't feel that like an exclusive. There was definitely interest to do so. An exclusive deal with a streamer would have been the way to go. Because if what you're going for is the gold of a sustained stream of consumer product revenue, it's not exactly the best place for that. Now, they can be part of the puzzle, and they absolutely should be, as far as creating ubiquity for the content. But that's just a piece of it. And so I think it's the go-to-market strategy. It is that 360 of it that we also have to get right. Um, and, and then, you know, then tending to the flock, that super important is sort of maintaining that brand and the brand resonance. Um, and that's the other part of the process that, you know, it's, it's sustaining that over many, many years to come. That's, you know, and again, I look at the major companies, you referenced Disney, who is like, you know, the most amazing place for that. And you just like, look at the endurance of these franchises. It is, it's wildly impressive. I mean, it's, you know, it's decades. Um, so I think getting the rollout, got to get that right and sort of do that um, uh, sort of correctly uh, for our investors. Um, and, you know, and then it, it is also an interrelated again to the first point, um, about like retaining, attracting and retaining the greatest talent. So when I talk about like, what's right for our, um, you know, our employees, um, that's a very big part of it about keeping people, people engaged with incredible quality work, uh, creatively challenging and interesting. Uh, and that is very much interrelated to the first point. Um, and then I think, you know, it, it's all the back office stuff. It's just the super smart, you know, financial management. Uh, it's about getting the data right, uh, you know, and managing our AVOD network. It's about like the best in class consumer products organization. Uh, and it's just, it is, it is the coordination the symphony of bringing together uh, all of those pieces, the, the, the various parts of our company. So I think that, you know, I don't know if that's exactly three, but uh, I think those are the things that, you know, deliver long-term value. And, and we've talked about a lot of things that you think are maybe underappreciated or misunderstood by the, by the market and by investors and maybe even by the industry. But, you know, we're going to finish with the, the uh, question that we close every episode with, which is what do you think the most misunderstood or underappreciated aspect of this company is? Wow. Um, so I think that, I think that um, the investor community 
Well, let's put it this way. Our, our very dedicated and devoted investors, they get, they get the story. Uh, and clearly they've been there. They've doubled down there. You know, and I, I talk to uh, new investors every day that are trying to you know, accumulate positions in our company. Uh, and who have been following the story patiently for some time. Some I didn't even know that they were following it and, you know, have come to me quite knowledgeable. And, and I would say it's about the fact that you're seeing the tip of the iceberg. And I think that the, you know, perhaps what's misunderstood is, oh, that's the iceberg. No, it's the tip of the iceberg that you're seeing. And, um, so when, as just as an example, when we, you know, announced Yo Gabba Gabba, another fabulous franchise, was going to Apple TV Plus along with the entire Gabba library, and the the deal sort of, at least the library aspect of it, you know, hits our earnings. They go like, oh, well, that's the Yo Gabba Gabba thing, okay? And then, so what do you got for us this quarter? No, no, that's the very, very beginning. That's the starting gun on the Yo Gabba Gabba franchise. When we just announced this past quarter, uh, though it didn't occur in the quarter, but recently, uh, new Degrassi, and with an amazing creative team, by the way, at HBO Max, our first show for HBO Max, by the way, along with you know, a vast part of the Degrassi library. It's like, oh, well, you, that, that's Degrassi. And so like, that's over and done. No, 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 that's the beginning. And it, it was waiting for the right creative team. It was about like just getting it right, having the right telecast partner. Uh, and incidentally with US rights only, we hold global rights in all of that. We have AVOD rights. Um, and so you're just beginning to see this stuff emerge. It would be a mistake. And I think it is the, the mistake of the unsophisticated to go like, oh, well, that's oh, over and out. So you, you just did that. It is like what this is, is this is the very, very beginning of the marathon. And we're just into the first couple of miles. Um, and we will continue to, you know, uh, unfurl, you know, additional properties from the library. And by the way, very good original production pipeline too. That stuff doesn't get noticed. I mean, we're, we're in our third season of Chip and Potato, uh, which was an invented or new property that the creative team put on Netflix. That's really great. A lot of stuff doesn't run that long on Netflix. They like to, you know, refresh constantly, even with successful shows or seven seasons of Johnny Test. Um, these, th those are those things that just, again, lead to this layering and, um, and you know, streams of very reliable long-term earnings. That's the part that I think isn't necessarily understood. And I'll, I'll just say one other uh, misunderstanding about how having a studio is conflated with being a fender straightening shop. Uh, and it is not when most of what you have is proprietary. Um, and, and there's a huge difference between own and rent. We are owners. And I would say, finally, that same misunderstanding uh, sometimes pervades our AVOD network, where, frankly, most of the revenue is coming off of proprietary properties. And because MCNs got a bad rap, it's like, well, isn't that an MCN? No, no, that is a that is our proprietary network, and we do have partner properties on it, for sure, great partner properties. But that just really is for purpose of scaling the network and optimizing and data collection. That you need a certain amount of scale so that we take on that partner content as well. But in a lot of that stuff, I mean, you look at what we're doing. We have deep equity stakes and partnerships. Uh, in a lot of that content. And, you know, we may not have the copyright certificate suitable for framing, but we have distribution rights. We have licensing and merchandising rights. We have profit participations. 
et cetera. So there's a lot more than meets the eye. There are a lot of moving parts to this. And, you know, I realize it's complex, uh, but I think that the more that I have these sorts of discussions and can unpack for people, like what this stack looks like, I think, you know, will be more understood. But it's a, you know, for a, it, it's not, we're not like a mining company and like, you know, how much did you extract from the ground? Okay, I get that. And it's like, I understand that metric. Um, I, I do understand there's a lot more complexity to this, but I think once that, once I do a better job of sort of explaining what the business is, um, I think that we will be amply rewarded. Well, it sure sounds like you've done a lot in the first few years and that there's a lot still coming. So um, I personally will look forward to seeing how this all plays out and, and, and what you guys else, what else you guys have in store. Uh, and I hope this content will be helpful to educating both existing and potential investors uh, about the company. So, Eric, this has been great. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. I hope I get invited back. Thank you. Eric. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices, and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better, and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at cobestreetcapital.com with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again, and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibagger.